Well, let us transition to your next article, which is going to involve some of what you were just saying, somebody struggling to get the answers correctly and providing some answers that seem correct and some that do not. So let's start. It's August 12th. You posted this at the Alhambra Investments blog, and it is titled Eugene Fama's Efficient View of Stimulus Porn. Now, Jeff, it has been my goal since we started this project to make economics erogenous again. Is that what you were going for with this title, with this article? Was it ever erogenous? I'm, I'm not sure we're going to make it again. I think that would be the first time that it had ever happened. No, I think what, what we're talking about, I, I, you know, Eugene Fama gave an uh, interview earlier this week, I believe, where he basically said this, you know, some of the things that we, we talk about all the time that we kind of take for granted, which is central banks aren't actually in the business of anything real. It's all posturing, he said, and it's really not, it's nothing more than signals and messaging and I think what he called, uh, you know, he, he's the one who compared it to porn pornography and said it's basically entertainment, which is what I've been saying for a long time when I call monetary policy a puppet show. Uh, I'm more family friendly in the way I put it than Eugene Fama. But I think, you know, he may be not us, but he may be the first one to, to think economics is, is, or central bankers at least, are sexy. Well, actually, he's not the first. I know that uh, Steve Keen often makes a the economist, the, the rebel economist. He often uh, brings up uh, prostitution as part of his analogy to how banks really function. I'm not going to go into it because this is a family show, but maybe in a future episode or in a late night version of this show. I'll talk to you about that late night version later, Jeff. All right, let's start with the obvious question that's on everyone's mind right now, who was Louis Bachelier? He was a guy in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, around 1900, who first started to look at markets and market prices specifically with a view toward making it more scientific, more scientific analysis to what was going on. Back then it was almost like sort of, you know, mysticism and, and, you know, things like that, superstition that guided most uh, mainstream views of what was going on in the marketplace. And th that's when there was any thought about it at all. Remember, Adam Smith's invisible hand kind of ruled how people interpreted markets. And so uh, Louis Bachelier said, now I'm going to start looking, I'm going to take mathematical view, statistical view at the marketplace and see if I can't start learning something more, you know, more fundamental beliefs, more deeper truths about what's going on in the marketplace. And so he was the first one who really started to, to create the framework of what we call today modern finance. You know, what I was struck as I was reading your article was that Bachelier, Bachelier, oh gosh, I wish I could speak French, Louis Bachelier, his instructor was none other than another Frenchman whose name I can't pronounce, Henry Poincaré, uh, who Encyclopedia Britannica describes as, quote, a French mathematician, one of the greatest mathematicians, and a mathematical physicist at the end of the 19th century who made a series of profound innovations in geometry, the theory and differential equations, electromagnetism, uh, topology, and the philosophy of mathematics. And the reason he's on my radar screen is because he is in a section of quotes. I try to keep uh, quotes of interesting things I read. And he is in the section that's titled Mathematis, uh, Mathemat uh, Mathematical Minds That Believe in Uncertainty Versus Economists Who Believe in math Mathematical Certainty. And so he's one of those people that uh, gave a number of quotes that mathematics and physics suggests uncertainty, the inability to, be, uh, to have knowledge, that we're limited to it. And yet... Uh, economists are pursuing trying to be a hard science like mathematics uh, and I just found that ironic that the two are moving in separate directions. Yeah I think the best part about that especially your quote of you know point care was you know a, was a very groundbreaking mathematician especially in working with non-Euclidean geometry and and what happened in the 19th century overall especially in the, phys in the science of physics but that they began to realize that the world was not deterministic. It wasn't, a, it wasn't that you could just write down a bunch of simple equations and then realize everything about those simple equations and therefore define everything 
with these certain set of rules that would allow you to basically describe the entire universe. In fact, what for most physicists throughout the 19th century began to realize was that, no, there was so much uncertainty that, that even if you define simple rules, there was so much unpredictability in complex systems that the, the entire universe was not Newtonian. It was essentially a probabilistic universe. And of course, like that became, uh, went from Newtonian science into um, quantum physics. And it's ironic that economics has gone, as you pointed out, in the opposite direction. So where econo economists want to be physicists, and they want to employ all the mathematical equations that they, they put the complex equations up on the chalkboard, make themselves sound like physicists, when in fact physics went in the complete opposite direction, which was toward a probabilistic, non-deterministic state, whereas in econometrics, we're all supposed to believe that it's also easily explained by statistical regressions. And it's it's a very poignant divergence that explains a lot about what we just talked about, which is why the paradigm hasn't shifted, because economists are certain they've got it right. <laughs> yeah, thank you for putting it so eloquently. And if the audience will just bear with me, I've got to read these two quotes, which are just beautiful and brain wrinkling. Here's one from Henry Poincaré, quote, geometry is not true. It is advantageous. Wow, amazing. Here's another one. This one's a little bit longer. Absolute space, that is to say the mark to which it would be necessary to refer the earth to know whether it really moves, has no objective existence. The two propositions, one, the earth turns round, and two, it is more convenient to suppose the earth turns round, have the same meaning. There is nothing more in the one than the other. Mind-boggling, amazing. Yeah, that's just, you know, it's certainty versus uncertainty, right? I mean, for us, again, what we just talked about in the previous segment, the idea that it's comfortable that we can, you know, that we believe the earth turns, therefore, whether it does or not, as long as we believe it, it's comfortable for us. We live in the bubble, you know, Euclidean geometry with all its straight lines and, and very precise movements and calculations that it, that it led people to create was a comforting thought, the idea that things were very simple and that we don't, you know, unpredictability and what would later become chaos theory in the 20th century. These things are, are very uncomfortable thoughts and uncomfortable um, intrusions upon our self-deluded bubble. Let's talk some more physics. Now, I believe it was a little bit less than a year ago that you were on the air with Keith McCullough as part of Hedge Eye's uh, kind of live conference that they did, and you were one of the guests. And Keith will often reference Brownian motion on his daily macro show uh, in reference to the movement of stock prices. He's dismissive about it. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned Brownian motion in your article. What is it? Brownian motion is the idea that there's um, unpredictability in the movement of fluids. In other words, you know, we have individual molecules that make up a fluid. Well, how does a fluid, you know, has a fluid overall trying to predict how it moves well, is it a function of all the individual molecules or is it a function of the fluid? I mean, is there some way they interact? Can we tell how they interact? Can we tell about how the individual molecules interact? That will tell us something more about the whole. And you can see how Brownian motion appealed to Louis Bachelier when he was trying to figure out stock prices because are markets the sum of the whole? Are they the whole than the parts? I mean, how, do, how does markets actually move? Is there individual pieces of information that get traded? And, and it leads us into at least them at least, into the idea that there's an efficient market. And that's what Eugene Fama was famous for, coming up with the theory of efficient markets. Because what he said was essentially that, yes, there is a certain amount of beauty to the randomness in stock prices that, that told us that these must be efficient markets. So, Jeff, this is you, the, the subject of this article and this episode, this section, is Eugene Fama. We haven't even talked about him yet. And we're not going to just yet. We've got one more pair to talk about, one more pair of mathematicians. And uh, I encourage everyone that's listening and watching to read this article by Jeff. It was a real good one. Uh, let's talk about Paul Samuelson and Benoit Mandelbrot. You brought them up in your article. And I have to bring up Keith McCullough again because uh, Mandelbrot's 2004 book, the Misbehavior of Markets, A Fractal View of Financial Turbulence sits number one on Keith's 
uh, top 10 list of most important books that explains market behavior. Uh, Jeff, Paul Samuelson, Benoit Mandelbrot, how do they fit into this story about Eugene Fama? Well, they, were a couple, they wrote a couple of influential papers in the 1960s, which, eventually, which gathered a lot of empirical evidence for the debt or for the uh, empirical evidence that Eugene Fama would later use to describe his efficient market theory. And Benoit Mandelbrot, of course, is who's famous for his fractal geometry, which is trying to explain what was later called chaos theory, which is the unpredictability of complex systems. So, you know, he plays a role in, you know, how we go, you know, we're going in the wrong directions, at least in terms of economics. But in this context of finance, what him and what he and Samuelson and a couple others, is like economists like uh, Paul Kuttner had done too, was they had gathered empirical evidence that said, you know, it really does seem like Stock prices, when you when you account for you know things like earnings retention, with you know earnings growth, the, what we're supposed to believe is the basis for all stock prices, the, the the behavior of those prices does appear to be random, and therefore it led Fama to then to describe why that would be, which was his efficient market hypothesis, which is essentially that you know every bit of information that's available is in the stock market. It's it's in all of the market prices today, and if something changes tomorrow. It must be because something, some new information became available tomorrow. It can't be that they're, you know, the market was wrong today because it's an efficient market. Okay, exactly. You got to the heart of the matter. Why did you raise Eugene Fama? It's because he wrote that paper about efficient markets hypothesis that markets can see deeply into the future. And you're raising him because he just did an interview, or at least the interview was just published a couple of days ago, I'm going to read a quote from that, or, uh, from that uh, interview just right now. Here, quote. This is Fama speaking. Frankly, I think this is just posturing. Actually, the central banks don't do anything real. They are issuing one form of debt to buy another form of debt. If you are an old Mag Modigliani and Miller person, the way I am, you think that's a neutral activity. You're issuing short-term debt to buy long-term debt or vice versa. That's not something that should have any real effects. That's why I used to say that the business of central banks is like pornography. In essence, it's just entertainment and it doesn't have any real effects. Jeff, straight fire, pure fire. Yeah, it's, it's, he agrees with us that it's a puppet show and it really is. And I think you know one thing that we need to emphasize more and more here is that look, the modern central bank and their conception of the modern central bank is relatively new. It's a relatively new phenomenon. The idea that these are, these are you know, the wisest, best, brightest um, philosophers, stewards, whatever you want to call them, operating this technocratic ideal with the printing press and all this power at their fingertips that they can use easily, that's something that didn't come about until relatively recently. For most of the Federal Reserve's history, it was a joke. People actually, you know, it was not something that people would want to ever um, uh, uh, think of as something that was a useful tool or any way, uh, you know, some, some major kind of breakthrough or groundbreaking achievement because most of its history is a tragic history. It gets more things wrong than it ever got close to being right. So what, you know, from Fama's point of view, when he was writing his uh, efficient market hypothesis, you know, when he was going back into the marketplace and thinking about these, these mathematical equations and things like that, you know, his view at that time was not of the Federal Reserve as some mythical, powerful, great force of good. It was a joke. And so classical money theory looks at the modern Fed as, what the hell are these guys doing? They're just, they're just waving their hands around and making a big display about things. They're not actually doing things because the modern central banker believes the symbolism, mere symbolism and expectations and how people are supposed to interpret those symbols is, is equivalent or even better than actual monetary money supply uh, issues. So that first quote, it seems like Eugene Fama is shooting pure barrel fire at the Federal Reserve, uh, shots fired, as, the, as Twitter would like to say. Uh, he's punctured their ship below the waterline. It's sinking. But wait a minute. Then he comes out with another quote. And this one unravels it for me a little bit. Here's what he says, quote, the market seems pretty good. It held up even though the economy is deep in the bucket. This is a good example of how forward looking the market really is. It's looking past what we are going through now and it's saying that the future 
doesn't look that bad. Jeff, do we have to accept this statement because we accepted the previous one? Or can we do like with Milton Friedman, where we pick some quotes as, you know, and we identify them as yes, that's right, and then others dubious? Well, let's be clear. He was talking about the stock market in particular. And so what he was saying is now stocks are back at record highs. That isn't necessarily inconsistent with the fact the economy is in the toilet. What he's saying is that, again, remember, this is the efficient market guy. Therefore, the markets are never wrong. And what he's saying is, okay, yeah, it's bad today, but stocks are saying it's going to be really, really good tomorrow. Again, that, you know, we're talking about new information and how we're supposed to price all these things. But, you know, what is it really tomorrow? Is it next month? Is it next year? Is it the next decade? Because what we're really talking about is there's, if monetary policy is not really part of the equation and, and you, you found doesn't believe it is and you and I believe don't believe it is either, then what's real, where are we supposed to believe this? You know, what, by what basis are we supposed to believe that the last 13 years are just going to end? Uh, you know, we're going to go into this brand new golden age based on what? The fact that we went into an even deeper economic contraction, that's going to be the basis for, that's going to be the springboard for the next big jump in the economy. No, and it, it, you know, but that's what Fama has to say. Look, he can see, that, as we do, that the central banks don't really matter. They're doing a bunch of you know, entertainment. I wouldn't call it pornography. I think it's, it's the best, a, a bad puppet show. You know, whatever. But anyway, you know, so if central banks don't matter, we have to explain what's going on in the stock market. And, what you, and since Eugene Fama is a fish and market guy, he has to believe that the markets are looking down the road at when things are going to look good. When I say that, well, how far down the road are they looking, right? That's right. That's right. And that's what you raise in your next article, which is called FAMA 2, No Inflation for Old Central Banks. Uh, you posted it on August 12th at Alhambra Investments. Jeff, is this a sequel to Cormac McCarthy's 2005 book, No Country for Old Men, or the Coen Brothers 2007 movie of the same name, or is it to the post that you, uh, you uploaded just a few hours ago? Well, since we're talking about randomness and non-randomness, I think that No Country for Old Men probably applies the best, though I have to admit that that was mostly accidental. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, and you start off that article, this part two of our Eugene Fama story, you start off by, by uh, drawing to our attention that the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that consumer prices for July 2020 were a roaring hellfire of inflation, the kind we haven't seen for 30 years. I, I describe it as a roaring hellfire, but it was an all-time 30-year high. Score one for central banking, true? Well, the core CPI was up, I think, 62 basis points month over month, which was, as you pointed out, the highest, I think, uh, since 1991, which was after three straight, well, it was you know, after three straight months earlier this year where we had contractions for the first time in history, which indicated deflation. So are we getting out of deflation into deflation? And is Jay Powell responsible for it? And should we congratulate the guy for printing so much money that it's getting into consumer prices already? And the answer is obviously no, but... Uh, what happened was we went through a deep hole and we're starting to reopen. Things are starting to rebound. And that's all that happened in the CPI. Of course, CPI went back up to where about it would have been had there not been a hole in the economy opened up in March, April, and May. So it wasn't necessarily congratulations, Jay Powell, so much as thank God we're reopening things again. And I'm going to bring Eugene Fama into this because in the interview he just did, he thought he talks about inflation. So uh, I want people to grab the undersides of their chair and hold on as they're about to hear this quote. Quote, so based on classic monetary theory, you don't really know what's determining inflation at this point. There is no control over the stock of what qualifies as money since reserves aren't really money anymore because they're paying interest. And we'll come back to that. That means you can't control the currency supply. In other words, inflation is totally out of the control of central banks. Jeff, I'm dizzy. I'm going to lay down. You talk for a while. <laughs> well, he's getting at the right answers, the right conclusion for the, using the wrong frame of reference to get there. 
And the, what he's basically saying is that IOER turned bank reserve from currency into debt. And therefore, the Fed is simply doing a maturity transformation or asset swap by buying longer dated debt and issuing uh, these, these interest paying bank reserves, which are simply a form of shorter dated debt. And that's as, as in classical money theory, that's a neutral uh, action because you're just swapping maturity of one debt form for another debt form. You're not actually increasing the level of currency. Now, that's something that we talk about all the time, that bank reserves are essentially inert form of a liquid asset, not really currency itself. So he's looking at the same thing we're looking at and trying to interpret what he's seeing, which is the central bank irrelevance and bank reserves not functioning as money, under his previous paradigm, his previous worldview, classic money theory, where you know bank reserves are supposed to be money if they don't pay interest. What we say is that, no, that's irrelevant. The bank-centered euro dollar system uses other forms of money, of which bank reserves were never one of them. And so the level of bank reserves, whether it pays interest or not, is irrelevant to the monetary system. And sentimental effects aside, but in technical, in technical matters, it's irrelevant. So we come to the same conclusion as Eugene Fama, but using very different uh, worldview and very different forms of interpretation framework to do so. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, fascinating that he used, references interest on excess reserves and how he has to involve that. I mean, for a while, they weren't paying interest on excess reserves. Is that, is that right, Jeff? Early on in 2008, during, well, towards the end of 2008, for a while, they weren't paying, right? And so at, if they had theoretically continued not paying interest on excess reserves, would he then be forced to say that it was money and inf that they were in charge of inflation? Well, yeah, and I think it's a, it's a puzzle that a lot of economists have struggled with because they see all these bank reserves and realize that it's, not, it's, it's supposed to be money printing. Why isn't it being money printing? And so they're kind of reverse engineering why bank reserves have not led to all of the things that money printing is supposed to bring about. And what they've settled upon, a lot of them have settled on, is it must be interest on reserves which is a ridiculous proposition too, because you're going to believe that, you know, for most of the history paying what 25 basis points is the reason banks won't go out and lend for four or 5% in the marketplace. No, it's, it's what that happened was they went back and said, well, something must've changed because we believe bank reserves are money. Classic money theory posits that bank reserves are a form of currency. The fed printed a lot of new currency, but it didn't lead to the effects of printed currency. Therefore, it must have been interest on reserves that changed the nature of bank reserves. And that's really the point. That's the point that we make a lot in Eurodollar University is that no, bank reserves had, didn't change in 2008. They had changed a very long time before then by a evolution in money in the previous decades that just went unrecognized under the previous paradigm. And so yeah, they come to the same conclusion that we've already come to but doing it for different reasons because they don't realize that bank reserves and the monetary system isn't what classic money theory actually believes it to be. Being stuck in your paradigm and unable to break out of it and unable to see uh, the world in a different lens. That's the problem. Sometimes I worry that we may fall into it. So I have to, you know, we have to keep on our toes too, Jeff, to keep our eyes open and see if there's any disconfirming evidence of our theory. Before we well, that's end, feel. that's, yeah, that's really one good reason why we bring up Eugene Fama here, because he's, he look, he's looking at the same things that we're looking at. And in a lot of ways, he's coming to the same conclusions we are. He's saying, look, as long as we stick to the evidence, as long as we're honest about it, the issue isn't the evidence or being honest. It's in how we interpret what the, what the evidence is saying. Mm -hmm. So he's interpreting it under his paradigm. We're interpreting it under ours. But the evidence is there. And as long as we remain faithful to that evidence, which is central banks are, you know, nothing more than pornographic entertainment, puppet show, however you want to characterize it. They're not monetary agents. It's not really a bank. Therefore, as long as we remain faithful to the evidence that continues to show that, you know, I think we'll, we'll be okay. We won't, we'll, you know, we'll always run the risk of our own biases and confirmation bias being one of the big things we have to be always be aware of. But so long as we're evidence-based and, and try to continue to, 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 to continue our, analysis and interpretation by using evidence and, and being honest about it, I think we'll be okay. And that's really what, you know, I think is, is broken down economics is it's gotten so rigid, so ideologically, you know, put into its own box that it refuses all of the evidence that's, that keeps saying, look, you've got it wrong. You need to change. And so 
And instead, IOER is a perfect example. Bank reserves have shown, the history for the last 13 years has shown, bank reserves are not money printing. So instead of going back and blaming IOER, maybe we need to go back and reinterpret the entire monetary paradigm. Yeah, it's fruitless to argue uh, religious theology, uh, to argue on those points, on theology. And that's what economics has become. It's, it's not so much a science or a, a philosophy, but it's a, a religion in certain circumstances. And one of those is the efficient market hypothesis when applied to stocks. This is the last issue I want to talk about with respect to this article. We haven't touched on it. You did talk about how Eugene Fama is saying that the stock market is up because it's looking so far deeply into the future, but you maintain, no, it's because central banks are good at press relations, which is what Milton Friedman uh, said. Do you, do you want to say anything uh, about that aspect of your article? Yeah, I think, you know, we do have to explain where stocks are coming from. Why, how do they fit into our worldview? And we, our worldview is that, you know, QE is not money printing, bank reserves are not effective money. Therefore, well, what is driving the stock market? And if you know anything about the financial services industry and how everybody is trained within it, you understand that the idea that you don't fight the Fed, the Greenspan put, all of these things, you know, these modern myths that have come about in the last you know, 30, 40 years are deeply ingrained in the financial services industry. And so people are conditioned to believe that the Fed is an all-powerful, omniscient engine. And if it says it's going to stimulate the economy, you better buy in advance of that stimulation or you're going to be left behind. And then it becomes simply the madness of crowds because even if you don't believe that, because share prices are rising, you got to buy too because share prices are rising. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, which, by the way, is the entire point of monetary policy. It's supposed to make everything from inflation expectations to the stock market to consumer spending and business investment into a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is what, by the way, I mean, that's what Eugene Fama was essentially lamenting, that, that central banks don't do anything real. They try to get everybody to do these things they want the economy to do on their behalf. And so once you realize that, and the financial media being the primary tool for the central bank to operate on this, this type of, of system, this type of expectations arrangement, that's really what's in the monetary toolkit. It's not a printing press. There's no currency in it. It's a bunch of stories that will get written, that everybody knows will get written, to basically parrot whatever any central bank says. It doesn't matter how many times you do QE, it's always the most powerful thing ever done. Well, Jeff, I have to admit that I had sort of misunderstood what this section of our uh, show was going to be about. I thought it was going to be about making economics erogenous again, and that's why I brought that book out. But I'm going to leave that for another show, and I'm just going to tell the audience that if you're interested in reading more of Jeff's work, you can find it at Alhambra Investments, but also at Real Clear Markets, which is where we turn to next. <laughs>